slander is defined as a noun, the action or crime of making a false spoken statement damaging to a person's reputation. As a verb, to make false and damaging statements about someone. So as you can ascertain, slander is a false statement which is intended to defame or harm the character of someone. I will repeat, a false statement. It is not slander if the statement that embarrasses a person is factually true. But this isn't how Muslims understand slander. To gain what Muslims, or to gain an understanding of what Muslims view slander as, let's open up the Sharia manual known as the Reliance of the Traveler. Here we see that slander or, slander or gibba is defined as a means to mention anything concerning a person that he would dislike, whether about his body, religion, everyday life, self, disposition, property, son, father, wife, servant, turban, garment, gate, Movements, smiling, dissoluteness, frowning, cheerfulness, or anything else connected with him. Okay, so Gibba is also associated with Narwawi. So slander and table bearing is what Narwawi is, are two of the ugliest and most frequently met with qualities among men, few people being safe from them. I have begun with them because of the widespread need to warn people of them. So here's what table bearing is. As for table bearing, namima, it consists of quoting someone's words to another in a way that worsens relations between them. So here's the evidence that slander and table bearing are unlawful. The above Define slander and table bearing. As for the ruling of them, it is that they are unlawful by consensus of Muslims. There is much explicit and intersubstantiative evidence that they are unlawful from the Quran, the Sunnah, and the consensus of the Muslim community. For example, Allah, the Most High, says, Do not slander one another. That's Quran 49 12. In Quran 104.1, it says, Woe to the to whomever disparages others behind their backs or to their faces. Slander, going about with tails, which is Quran 68.11. And the prophet, peace be upon him, said, The table bearer will not enter paradise. This is what he says about slander. Do you know what slander is? And they answered him, Allah and his messenger know best. He said, it is to mention of your brother that which he would dislike. Someone asked, well, what if he is as I say? Or in other words, what if I tell the truth about him? And he, Muhammad, replied, if he is as you say, then you have slandered him. And if not, then you have culminated him. He also says, the Muslim is the brother of the Muslim. He does not betray him, lie to him, or hang back from coming to his aid. All the Muslim is unavoidable to his fellow Muslim, his reputation, his property, his blood. God-fearingness is here, when he was pointing to his heart when he said here. It is sufficiently wicked for someone to belittle his fellow Muslim doesn't mention anything about not Muslim, but that's besides the point. Not only is it a sin, and not only is it haram to slander, it's actually haram to listen to slander. So this is what it says in the Reliance of the Traveler. Just as slander is unlawful for the one who says it, it is also unlawful for the person hearing it to listen and acquiesce to. It is obligatory whenever one hears someone begin to slander another to tell him to stop it, if this does not entail manifest harm to himself. If it does, 
create harm to themselves, then one is obligated to condemn it in his heart and to leave the company if able. When the person who hears it is able to condemn it in words or to change the subject, then he must. It is a sin for him not to. But if the hearer tells the slanderer to be silent while disturbing him in his heart to continue, this, as Al Ghazali notes, is hypocrisy, and that does not lift the sin from him, for one must dislike it in their heart. So let's think about this. Slander isn't defined in the same way for Muslims as it is for, well, everyone else. Slander has no condition for truthfulness or falsehood under the guidelines of the Muslim understanding. So under their understanding, saying something that is true that results in the embarrassment of someone is actually considered to be slander and is forbidden or haram. So once you understand the principle that saying anything embarrassing is considered slander, then you can understand the mindset of almost every single Muslim. Well, they will react in exactly the same way and feel themselves just as justified as anyone else when they stand up to defend the person being slandered. But the problem here is they're not justified in it if what the person is saying is true. So the Muslims will defend their false prophet when he is attacked using truthfulness because, well, the truth about their prophet is rather embarrassing. It's embarrassing not only to them, but also to Muhammad and to their entire religions. So as Christians or polemicists, we need to keep this in mind when we're engaging with Muslims that they will lie to your face and they will feel justified in their lie because you are embarrassing them and their religion and their prophet and their fake God. Right? So when someone feels, when the Muslim feels justified in their lie, that means that they're going to lie without the sense of shame or guilt. If someone's lying without a sense of shame or guilt, they're going to be much more deceptive in their lie. And they're going to be, quite frankly, very good liars. Using this understanding of how Muslims view slander It actually explains a lot of how we engage with them because they always twist everything that we talk to them about. So they'll twist biblical characters and stories about them, right? So remember that the Muslim will not recite an embarrassing thing about any of the prophets. So one of the most embarrassing facts about any of the prophets is King David. Uh, In his life, he committed adultery and then he conspired to murder the husband of his mistress. The Muslims in the Quran kind of have a rendition of this story, right? It's very vague. And in fact, the Quran makes no direct reference to David's sin. So prepare yourself, everyone, for a completely disjointed and nonsense story. So here we go, Quran chapter 38, verses 21 through 25. And by the way, this is the full context of the story. This is how it goes. Has the tiding of the dispute come to thee? When they scaled the sanctuary, when they entered upon David, and he took fright at them, and they said, Fear not, two disputants we are, and one of us has injured the other. So judge between us justly, and transgress not, and guide us to the right path. And one of them said, Behold, this is my brother. He has ninety-nine ewes, which are lambs, and I have one ewe. So he said, Give her into my charge. And he overcame me in the argument. Said he, Assuredly, he has wronged thee in asking for thy ewe in addition to his sheep. And indeed, many intermixers do injury one against the other, save those who believe and do deeds of righteousness and how they are few. And David thought that we, plural of majesty, talking about Allah apparently, had only tried him. Therefore, he sought forgiveness of his Lord, and he fell down bowing, and he repented. Accordingly, we, 
majesty, forgave him that, and he has a near place to our presence and a fair resort. Okay. First of all, I can almost guarantee you that that story made exactly no sense to you. It made no sense to me. I read it a whole bunch of times, right? So let's notice a few things. The story has exactly no context whatsoever. It's literally an incoherent rambling. Two men, according to the story, sneak into David's room and bring up some dispute about lambs. David makes a judgment about the lamb and then proceeds himself to repent. What? Why? What did David repent for? Why did that dispute bring him to repentance? Well, we have to actually go outside the Quran to figure out what on earth is happening. So we'll go to the prophet's cousin, Ibn Abbas, and read what his tafsir says to see if we can make any sense of this nonsense. So in the this is what he says. And the two went out from whence they came. So they're talking about the two men. And David guessed he knew and was certain that we had tried him because of the sin he committed. And he sought forgiveness of his Lord from his sin. And he bowed himself and fell down prostrate, prostrate and repented, feeling remorse for what he did doesn't really help, right? So David has committed a sin, correct? Right? So what what sin has David committed? Well, Ibn Abbas explains a little bit. Lo, this is my brother hath 99 or 90 and 9 ewes, meaning 99 wives. Oh, the ewes are apparently wives because domesticated animals, I guess, represent women. While I had one wife, one you. And he said, entrust it to me. And he conquered me in his speech. This is a similitude which they struck for David in order for him to understand what he did to Uriah. First of all, who's Uriah? Where do we get Uriah from? What did he do to Uriah? Right? We can ascertain that David apparently had lots of wives, 99 perhaps, and that Uriah had a wife and David took it from him, right? But this is, this is not clear, and this is definitely not actually in the Quran. This is from the tafsir. So the perfectly clear Quran says what it doesn't say, and it doesn't mention the name Uriah, right? So we must rely upon man's words, Ibn Abbas, to make this utter nonsense of a Quran remotely comprehensible. Abbas says this utter nonsense about David hurting Uriah. Now, if there was no Bible, would anyone know what Abbas is talking about? No, not at all. But according to Muslims, our corrupt Bible all of a sudden becomes 100% necessary for making this nonsense book called the Quran remotely sensible. But who were these two men, I wonder? Well, the Quran literally just says two men. And once again, the clear Quran needs men to try to make sense of it. This is what Abbas goes on to say. How they burst in upon David, and he, David, was afraid of them. They, i.e., the two angels who entered in on David, said, Be not afraid, we are two litigants, one of whom hath wronged uh, the other. Therefore judge all right justly between us, but not unjust. Do not be partial and transgress not, and show us the fair way. Show us what is right. So with the help from the mortal non-prophet man named Ibn Abbas, we can gather that the two angels, apparently now, not men, disguised themselves as men and climbed a wall and then broke into David's quarters. Why, if these angels can shapeshift into men, why do they need to climb a wall in this story? Absolutely beyond me. It always makes sense if you don't think about it. The B&E, which stands for Breaking and Entering Angels, corner David and immediately begin to bring up some nonsense story about lambs 
pronouncing no context whatsoever and giving no summary and then just disappearing from the story altogether. There's no exit, no mention of them going anywhere. It's just they're in, they say, and then the story's over. That's it. No beginning, no middle, no end. Just a whole bunch of nonsense, right? So for no mentioned reason, David then repents of a sin. And surprise, surprise, the sin in the Quran is not mentioned. And we are supposed to believe that these are the clear words of Allah? Well, I will actually tell you what is clear about the Quran. What's clear about the Quran is it is clearly a book written by an inept author. But all of that is besides the point. The point here is actually to show the Islamic principle of slander and why the Quran refuses to simply speak the truth, especially in this circumstance, the truth about David. Another key Muslim story that Muslims have changed because, well, they find it to be embarrassing is the crucifixion of Jesus. So sure, this embarrassing fact is outright denied by the Quran. To the Muslim mind, it is better that their God lie about what actually happened and about actual historical proofs and facts that might embarrass them. They'd rather, they'd rather lie than to be embarrassed about the truth. So you see, Islam isn't interested in the truth. Islam is interested in controlling you and making as many adherents as possible. They want you and everybody else to become just like them, brainwashed by an illiterate 7th century caravan robber, cult leader, child molester, rape encourager, wife beater, slave owner, the sun sets in a spring of water, and sexual fluids gush from the backbone and ribs, warlord. They want you to follow a man who is dead, who was so insecure that he had people who mocked him murdered. You see, the leader of that wicked cult was an emotional midget that yield military might, and he would stop at nothing to neutralize anyone who might make fun of him. Somehow, this idea, an insane cult leader, is still generating followers to this day who adapt the same infantile sensitivities that he once had. You must not slander the prophet or his religion, even if it's true. Mm. Right? So, say something true about Muhammad that's embarrassing? Well, this is what happens. His minions will first try to explain it the way, oh, no, 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 this is, you just don't understand what it really is. Right? They, they, they try to use uh, illogic, but they try to use some degree of logic. And then eventually, as you push back, they will outright lie to your face. It doesn't say that. No, 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 no. What it actually says is you have to actually understand the Arabic of the thing, because if you don't understand the Arabic, there is no way for you to do that. Right? It's preposterous. So if they can't explain it in a way, right? If you're like, no, that's ridiculous. Your Islamic scholars actually have translated these things honestly and with integrity. So your whole little, it has to be an Islam, it has to be an Arabic mumbo jumbo just doesn't quite fly. So once you mention that to them back in the corner, then they will begin to attack you personally. And if not you personally, they will begin to attack your ideology, your belief, your religion. And they do my, what I think they do the most of, which is called the two quo quo fallacy, meaning like, oh, you find this objectionable in my religion? Well, let me tell you about your religion, which has the same problem. Okay, that's a two quote fallacy. Uh, yeah. So anyway, so uh, once once they do that, they will try to get out of the conversation, right? And if that doesn't work and they can't exit the conversation, they will begin to attack you verbally. And if that doesn't work, then they will begin to turn to intimidation and threats. So if you're online talking to them, they will try to dox you or contact your employer to get you removed from your job. And if that doesn't work, they do what the Quran says. Chop at their necks. That's what they end up doing. Charlie Hebdo knows a lot about that. So to be fair... They're just insecure crybabies when it comes to their prophet. And the better we understand their mindset, the more well-equipped we will be in engaging with them. 
So you might be wondering why, if someone knows that they have to lie and that they have to lie to retain the position that they have to lie about and they have to pretend that their position is true, then they know they're lying. They know their position is false. So why would they continue to maintain that they are Muslims? In Islam, it isn't as simple as saying and realizing that, hey, look, you know what? I'm following a falsehood. Uh, let me go ahead and reject this falsehood and pursue truth. It's not that simple, right? Because if someone were to have that degree of integrity, then they would be threatened with their very life. So it's not simply a matter of pursuing truth and rejecting lies. It's a matter of life and death. Muslims are faced with the very real possibility of losing their life if they choose to reject Islam. Should they be willing to make themselves vulnerable to death, um, they might do that, but they have to consider making themselves vulnerable or maintaining a lie and keeping themselves alive. So this kind of fear-based Cult brainwashing psychology results in millions of people who live in constant cognitive dissonance and fear of losing their life. But you might be thinking, aren't you being a little bit extreme, A.T.? What proof is there that their lives are actually in danger? I know lots of Muslims and they're very peaceful, kind, loving, compassionate people. That's true. I agree. However, are they following the explicit teachings of their prophet and of their scholars? Let's go ahead and explore together. So, there's a book called The Summary of the Unsheathed Sword. It is by Ibn Taymiyyah, the Shika al-Islam, right? This means that he is one of the greatest scholars of all time. So this is what the book covers, right? And it covers four main issues that we're going to talk about today, right? The first issue, starting on page 13 of the book, says, whomever insults the prophet is to, drum roll please, be killed, whether they are a Muslim or a disbeliever. The second issue, killing is prescribed on him, the one who insults the prophet, and it is not permissible to imprison or show favor upon him or to ransom him. The third issue, any Muslim or non-Muslims who insults the prophet is to be, drumroll, killed, and repentance is not sought for after him. What is the contents of this book? Let's read a few passages. Isak bin Rahiwiwa who is one of Imam's praise by al-Shafi and Ahmad said, the Muslims have a consensus that whoever insults Allah or insults his messenger or rejects anything that was revealed by Allah or kills a prophet, then such a person is a disbeliever even if they affirm every re revelation from Allah. Imam Ahmad said, whoever insults the messenger or attributes a defect to him, whether a Muslim or a disbeliever, they are to be, drumroll, killed, and their repentance is not sought. And he said, whoever mentions something which conflicts with that the Lord Allah has mentioned, then they are to be killed. And Malik said, whoever insults him is to be killed, and repentance is not sought for after him. Ibn al-Qasim said, whoever insults him or attributes a defect to him is to be killed as the heretic. And some of the Malikis mentioned that whoever uh, disengages upon the prophet anything from the disliked matters, then they are to be killed, and their repentance is not to be sought. And I had mentioned the response of a group of the famous Maliki uh, Fakwa with killing and no seeking of repentance in their judgment. So these things that I mentioned... They are to be killed, and they are not to seek repentance from that person. So you're killed if a man who a people heard was mentioning the attributes of the prophet when a man with an ugly face and beard walked past him. So he said, do you desire to know the prophet's attribute? It is the same as this man who walked past. Attributing something that is ugly to Muhammad results in them being killed. A man 
who said that the prophet was black. What should happen to that man? He should be killed. Repentance won't be sought. He'll just get his head chopped. Okay. And from the man whom it was said by the right of the messenger of Allah. So he said, Allah did such a thing to him, killed. And from them that a tax collector said, pay and complain to the prophet. He is to be killed. No repentance required. Just chop his body from his head. It'll be exactly what all is said. And I'd like to add that this, by the way, is merely a fraction of the proof text that explain why someone slandering Muhammad or his fake God is to be killed. So this is what you see. You will see Muslims, uh, Muslim apologists tripping over themselves and stumbling in their words in order to avoid saying anything that could be taken as slanderous about Muhammad or Allah. Every educated person knows that Muhammad married a six-year-old and consummated the marriage with her when she was nine years old. Everybody knows emphatically that that is disgusting and pedophilia. But Muslims, because they don't want to slander, will seek any way possible to make something so explicitly disgusting seem, well, it's okay. They will take several approaches not to admit exactly what their sources say. So they might try to make Aisha seem older than what she herself said she was in three separate sources. They might try to say, so what? Uh, biblical characters uh, married children, even though that's demonstrably untrue. Again, that's the two quoque fallacy. And then they might uh, appeal to, well, it was different times back then, culture and girls matured faster and blah, 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 blah. Or they might just say, well, yeah, Muhammad did it. And whatever Muhammad did is good. So it's good that he, uh, you know, consummated a marriage with a nine year old girl. But any sane and rational person would simply say what's obvious. This is disgusting and gross. And because your prophet did that, he's not really a prophet because that kind of behavior is unbefitting to a prophet, right? And it's not to say that prophets can't sin, but it is a problem when you say that uh, that prophet doesn't sin and you don't condemn them. You need to condemn Muhammad, but you can't do it because that would be slander. And if you're slandered, you will lose your head. Okay. So Muslims dance around addressing issues like a game of musical chairs where the loser loses their head, which in the case is prescribed for them. And actually they lose their head if they admit the truth. So the truth will kill them. Another clear example is when Muhammad happened upon his scantily dressed daughter-in-law and then caused his son to divorce her so that he, Muhammad, can marry the, her himself. Clearly, this is all kinds of messed up, but Muslims will tap dance around and calling, calling what it is, right? What it is, is messed up. Uh, or about the most clearly incorrect and de demonstrably false claim made in the Quran, which is to say that reproductive fluid comes from the backbone and the ribs. This is obviously and objectively false. And yet Muslims, when confronted about, uh, about it, will jump around as if playing the game, the floor is lava. Or better yet, they are playing the game, if I admit this is wrong, my body will be separated from my head. Right? So the bottom line here today is that slander in Islam is grounds for unrepentant apostasy. Right? They know that if they slip up and admit that the Quran or their prophet is defective in any way at all, that they are to become apostates, that they become an apostates. And we all know, as I showed you in sources, that they are to be, drumroll please, killed. Okay. So when you are engaging with a Muslim, don't expect that your factual and clear cut evidences will be well received. It's not that your arguments don't make sense to them, because they surely do. It's that the person you're speaking to is fearful of being called out for apostasy and agreeing that their objectively false and obviously false prophet is defective, 
and his evil spirit, God, Allah, is exactly that, evil. So my friends, they do not know God. What they know is fear. Because the Bible tells us that perfect love casts out fear. And our Bible also tells us that God is love. Well, their false God is not love. Their false God is a slave master, and they are his slaves. So the real question we ought to be asking Muslims is if they actually believe in God, if they believe in heaven and hell. Or if they are simply agnostic or atheists pretending to believe in such obvious nonsense so that their community doesn't ostracize and kill them. In Islam, there is no hope. There is no hope in any ideology that is so clearly false. And there is no hope for the cowards who refuse to admit that fact that their ideology is false. Until the Muslims realize that God is, in fact, real, and that God, in fact, does truly love them, then they will hold on to their cowardly ideology and continue to swim and drown in their ocean, which is full of cognitive dissonance. If you are a Muslim right now, and you are truly brave enough to consider that your position might be false, and you're willing to look into and agree with the clear demonstrations of its falsehood, I implore you, please, please consider these words from Jesus, who had no fear of criticism himself. He had no fear of slander. Jesus didn't seek to conceal falsehood within himself because in Jesus, there is no fault or falsehood. We are not ashamed of Jesus. No Christian has any shame of Jesus. We don't have to hide things, lie about things, or conceal things about the truthfulness of Jesus. He truly is perfect. So Jesus said this to you who need to leave your false ideology. He said, for all of you who seek God, that if you ask, seek, and knock, that the door will be open to you, and you will find that the questions or the answers to your questions will set you free. And the truth isn't merely an idea. The truth is God incarnate in the flesh of Jesus who said this about himself. I am the way, the truth, and the life.